give me a, a testimony. It's kind of interesting because that uh, uh, Will, if you remember, was going uh, where he was working. He ended up uh, breaking one arm, and then he ended up breaking his uh, other arm, and was not able to uh, work for quite a while. And uh, he was, obviously was discouraged about it. But he said, "Why don't you fill out all your applications and get all your uh, get after school work and stuff? It's not the normal way of doing it in the field that he's in." He sent out the resumes and he sent out different things and the one job that he really was hoping for was at Oklahoma West End. And it, it's interesting, they didn't offer them the job and he was hired, but at the same time the person who hired him uh, is no longer in that position. And the person that's taken his position had a uh, relative that want, he wanted for that job. So you just see how the Lord was working things out to where, you know, you think it's raindrops and it's difficult, but at the same time, things worked out. And uh, so he's able to do what he was hoping to do, and he's further along than he could. And he said, in fact, I got a better job than any of my peers, even though they were uh, they're better in the field than what I am. So I think it's interesting just uh, how God can open doors. Uh, yesterday, we were uh, wearing a T-shirt. It was given to me, and I uh, don't usually have an opportunity to wear a lot of them just because of the type of work that I do. And I saw it, and I thought, well, I'll wear it given the, the gift from Ruthie to me, and it was on it, it's, Billy Graham had a quote on it. It said, I've never met a man who has received Christ and ever regretted it. And all we were watching the van, I know some people looked at it and made some comments. Well, when I went to lunch, I was going to take it off, and I thought, no, I'll leave it on. First night happened to, uh, where I go on Saturdays for lunch, is uh, uh, the owner, he and I become good friends, I work for him on occasion. He's Muslim, and he left Kuwait during the invasion of uh, when uh, Saddam was there and so he and I have different conversations so immediately he read uh, I thought well I'll leave it on for him to read it and uh, he read it out loud I could tell you know that we didn't get into a conversation but uh, I did want him and he could tell by his reaction sure enough later on in the day I went to uh, to get gas and it's the same thing the person stops reads it and one of those deals you know people see it but obviously you're making a statement and uh, I have one, you know, when I wear, you know, work hard, pray harder, things like that. And so I think it's interesting we can wear them, but then are we willing to give it a fence? So it's interesting, Will, then, uh, when he was at uh, Oklahoma West, he had a doctrinal statement, and he really wanted the job. But on the doctrinal statement, there's one doctrine, a step part that he didn't agree with. And so he was asking, he, he and I were talking, I said, well, you know, explain your, your view and tell him what it is. Uh, if you don't get the job, he said, well, no, I don't want to lie about it, but I would like the job. But I said, you just be honest and tell him. So he did, and they recognized the difference. We're not in the theology department, and we recognized the support a lot more of its semantics. Same thing happened with Sophie, and she was asked about the doctrinal statement, wanted him to sign, the different things you have to do. So what that does, it's uh, kind of interesting when all this has come up, because we were talking about coming up with a class on apologetics, in the fall sometime and just basically helping people to defend their faith. So just kind of a getting a, a touching off, what I'd like to do is today just a couple, a couple of verses and then we'll, uh, possibly a class will develop this fall, we'll see. But what I'd like to think about, it, what I'd like to be ready for a defense. I'm beginning to think I'm about to get shocked. I don't know. <laughs> Look over in First Peter chapter uh, Three for a moment, just some different things. I think it's interesting, but being ready to give a defense, and I think it's uh, true for all of us because we never know when that defense when you may be asked to give one or what you may have to do. And I may try some different batteries. Maybe that's it. Who knows? We're about to find out. 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll see if it does any better or not. Uh, we know it's in the antenna. We, uh, we're working on it. We're narrowing it down as to what it is. So we're getting there. Uh, notice First Peter chapter three, and it, it, it has to do with uh, 
if you remember in the book of First Peter, they're going under a lot of suffering. And so Jesus, uh, Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter is dealing with it. So go to verse 15, and I think it's some interesting things being ready to give defense. From 15 down to 17, then we'll look at it. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Keep a good conscience so that in things in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So notice, first of all, I think when talking about being ready to give a defense, notice the first thing it tells you is sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. You know, you think about how you define it. You're having a Christ-like life with Christ as your master. How many people have a Christ-like life with Christ as their master? Think about it when uh, Paul in Philippians 1, 21, for me to live as Christ and what? Die as gain. Die as gain. I really think for so many of us, if we're being honest as Christians, for me to live is, and what will we put in? A different job, a different house, different car. So many things to be added and we keep adding. And so for me, I think the interesting part is if we really are, we have to sanctify Christ as Lord in life, is he really ruling and reigning in your heart? You know, you think about it, Paul in Philippians chapter 3, uh, we'll look at it, I'm not sure if we'll get through all of it today. Look over in Philippians chapter 3 for a moment. Paul was addressing this, not only that he wanted to make Christ first in his life, but in Philippians chapter 3, Notice in verse 7, down to verse 9, For whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. How many of us would truly make that statement? Everything I've gained in life, your education, your job, your house, everything, is just rubbish. It's here today, I lose it tomorrow. It's rubbish in comparison to what I got from Christ. Did Paul, was he educated well? I mean, you think about it, he was at the top of his class, so to speak, when he came out that he gave it all up. But notice what he has on there. Nor that I count things to be lost in the view of surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus is my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may in Christ, may gain Christ, to be found in him, to have not the righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So you think about it, his discovery is I can't do it on my own, and everything I have is of little importance, but I have gained Christ, and he is really reigning my life, and that's what's important. When we want to sanctify Christ and want him in our life to rule and reign, how many of us what's the conclusion where we need to get to? If we're doing this, it's much harder for the opposition then to be throwing rocks because they see what we're truly serving and, and so on. And so you think about it, the description that you have, if you want to know how to do it, just go back to Philippians chapter 2 and think about it, this, how well this fits us. Notice in verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Have any of us ever done anything from selfishness or empty conceit? How many times do we not do it from selfishness or empty So Really, you know. How many times do we do things? And, but notice what he says, but with humility of mind, let each one of us regard one another as more important than himself. Notice verse 4. Do not merely look at your own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this attitude in you yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is only looking at his own interests would he have ever left heaven. No. He would not have left heaven and he would not have gone through the earth and suffered the death and everything else that he did for you and I. So you think about it, if we want to be have Christ as master, we have to be thinking of other people and serving them. And that's what the difference is, the sanctity part of it. You know, duty, you, know, you can look at this from a duty perspective. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, you've been bought with what? A price, therefore glorify God in your body. But we want to do it out of love and so on. And not just because we have to do it. I think it's interesting, the decision that you have is in Romans 12. Now don't be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the decision is up you and I. I mean, obviously in Romans 8, the battle is over the mind. If you don't believe it, what are all your advertisements always trying to do? You were content with what you had until you saw the commercial, right? 
amazing how they, what they, all those things are trying to get to your mind on all of them. So think about it. First of all, be, being ready to give a defense starts with the sanctity of Christ in your life. Coming to know Christ and then allowing Him to rule your life. Changes your values and everything else. And it's a process. That's why Paul in Philippians 4 says, I've learned to be content. Even after coming to know Christ, he wasn't content initially, but he had to learn the process. So you think about it. Who's running your life? Who's running your decision? You know, I, if you remember, there was a group called, that was out many years ago called Love Song. And uh, some of you remembered, uh, Tim sang it, I also sang the song. I don't ask him to do it, but anyway, I sang the song, you remember, Front Seat, Back Seat. And then it, it has to do with the, the person who said, I was trying to run my life and I was driving. I was driving the car and I was running stop signs and everywhere I was going, I was always getting there late. But when I turned over the driver's seat to the Lord and I sat in the back seat where I needed to be, I got there on time and got there like I should have. So it's kind of what you have here. Sanctity of Christ is you, you're going to the back seat and saying, remember Paul had plans, if you look in the book of Romans, Paul's plans were to stop by Rome for just a minute and go on to Spain. God had other plans for him. You remember he was put in prison. Did he ever get to Spain? To our knowledge, he never made it. And so, but Paul was willing to do what can God can change our plans. So first of all, think about the sanctity. And that's the second thing. You remember in First Peter 3, it says, always being ready to make a defense. And I want you to think about that. So when are we supposed to make a defense? It says whenever. Who's supposed to do it? All of us, right? You know, where are you supposed to do it? Everywhere. How many of us are willing, no matter what people say to us, or wherever we're at, they're, we're willing to give a defense wherever we're at, whatever's going on. And I think it's interesting. It also says how to do it. It says why. The hope that's in you. How many of us, or if you think about it, if you're going before court or doing anything else, how many of us are showing a hope? In and a person truly has that. You can see that hope in them, no matter what the circumstances are. But how many of us have that hope in us that when people look and say, man, they got something I want? You ever been around people that have that? They have that hope, and you want it. Whatever they have, you want it. That's what we need to be having. But notice it says with gentleness and reverence. We don't come in there with a shotgun and we start blowing everybody away. Uh, and that's what you have, you know, you have the church up in Kansas and so on, some of the things that they've done. I mean, they are not bringing people to Christ. They're making divisions and bringing a lot of problems with gentleness and so on. You're going to win people through gentleness and reverence, not through uh, the other way. But think about that, uh, how to do it. Second Corinthians, you think about chapter 5 and verse 18, they've already seen that, remember, we have a ministry of reconciliation. So people ask him, what do you have that's what the Philippian jailer did in, the, in Acts 16. You have responded differently than any jailer I've had before. What is it that you have? What must I do to be saved? What can I do? I want what you have. So think about it. That's just the passage itself. Let me think about some practical things that you can do to give a defense. In 2 Peter, I mean, me, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul's writing to Timothy. I want you to think about this for a minute because in the book of Acts was Timothy on the missionary journeys with Paul. He's on some of it with Paul. He's trained by Paul. He's in the early church. But he tells Timothy, even as a young pastor, he's in his 40s, study what? To show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So here you have a young man who's trained and everything else, but he's still supposed to do what? He's still supposed to be studying. And studying all the time. Is the medical field changing at all? So then you're going to have to study all the time. Is your cars changing at all? They're, the mechanics are having to go to classes all the time. Because the stuff is constantly changing. Why do we expect them to go to class and study and everything else? but you and I don't do the same thing. We have to likewise study the practical part. The other one, what about in Psalms, we know if you look at it, Psalms 119, 105, what does it tell us? Thy word, what? That I might not what? Okay, so just the practical. Am I studying? 
Am I looking, but what am I studying it? Am I letting it be my guide? How many of us are letting the Word of God be our guide, or how many of us are turning to other things? Another one you have, remember in 2 Peter 3, and verse 16, and then you have it also, uh, if you think about it in Ephesians 4, pastors are given, or evangelists and so on, are given to teach the people, so they won't be tossed to and fro by everyone the doctrine. 2 Peter 3 and verse 16, Peter writes that the unstable and and untaught distort Scripture. So as a young believer, it's easy to be caught up into false doctrine. It happens. One reason why we were talking about doing the class. Because how do you know what's right and what's wrong? I gave the illustration before. I'll never forget living at the other house. Jesse was real small, obviously real outgoing. And she comes in and she says, Oh, Daddy, I just... A guy was just outside, and he got in the car, and he, he offered me, uh, you know, a popsicle or whatever. And I mean, immediately, you know, you, you know, and she didn't go or whatever. I'm thinking, she thought it was just some this nice guy. And you and I, as adults, with uh, with thinking what? No, 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 that isn't that isn't the case at all. A friend of mine was a, was a missionary in Iraq. Two of them went over together. Two young ladies. When they got off, they're waiting on someone. Some people came up and said, oh, some young men came up and said, oh, I know where you're going. We'll give you a ride. And she had just got through watching the, the movie Taken. And her dad was making sure that she understood. And when the right people came and said, had you gone with him, he probably never would have seen you again. That's exactly what would have happened. Again, we have to do what? We have to be prepared in whatever field we're in. Get behind the car or anything else. You have to be prepared. Because we are, in a sense, driving a lethal weapon when we drive in a vehicle. How you live. So think about it. We have the practical part. We want to, you know, be ready to give a defense. But there's things that you and I can do. I'll never forget. I was 16. I went to the mall. I used Peter, Brother Peterson said, "I want you to go with me. We're going to go witness to people." And man, I was just like Sophie. I was scared to death. I didn't want to do it. But I, you know, Bud has a way of getting you to say yes even when you want to say no. We also went to, those who remember what Peoria was like in the late 60s and early 70s. I'll never forget sitting down and trying to witness to a guy, and he sat across from me, and I was going through, and he quoted every verse back then. You don't know your Bible very well, do you? I decided, you know, I better learn my Bible. That's one reason why I decided to go to school like I did. Well, what happens if we don't know our Bible very well? You ever think about it? I think for a lot of us, we don't do anything. So I want you to think about it. What about in John chapter 9? In John chapter 9, you remember the blind man? He was blind since birth. And they heal him. Jesus heals him. You remember in John 9? It's interesting. We can look at it. And remember, they then call his parents in. He asked him first because he has to present himself. And his parents are scared because they're afraid they're going to be kicked out of the synagogue, the temple. So they... Say, go ask him, he's of age. So remember, he tells them, and he goes through it, and they come back to him again. He tells them a second time, come back to him again. You notice it's interesting when you get down to verse 30, what the man says. The man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing. You do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God fearing and does his will, he hears them. Since the beginning of time, it's never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And then notice in verse 34, they kicked him out of the temple. The reason I'm bringing this up, what did the man tell him? He gave his testimony. He gave his testimony. What happened in the previous chapter of Samaritan woman? Why did the people from the city come out? Because he said, I found a man who told me everything I've done and he's never met me. You need to meet. So we cannot know it all. That's true in, in any field. Tell people what he's done in your life. Start there. Same thing can happen. You, I can get into different discussions. I can get into discussions when it comes to, I've had different ones come up to me wanted to debate creation versus evolution. I haven't had a science class in 45 years. There is no way I'm going to get into a scientific discussion with them. Because it, whether they're telling me the truth or not, I couldn't tell you. But I can tell them my testimony and I can tell them what Scripture said. We need to do the same thing. There's always going to be somebody we cannot, we don't know the knowledge that they have. 
but we can tell them what Christ has done in our life. So think about it. Give me an, asking you a question. Who would you like to? Oh, to, you know, any of you here would like to give your testimony? Isn't that what he said? Didn't the young man do it? Didn't the Samaritan woman do it? Did she care about what other people thought? Hey, I'm just going to tell you what I know. You know, I'd love for people to see me afterward and say, I'll give it to you and we'll set up time. A lot of you already have. What? You know, and how do you enjoy other people's testimony? You learn a lot about it. So I challenge you to do it. Another one, I'm talking about doing a class. Who would be interested in a class on apologetics? We're not talking about we're going to go and we're going to spend, uh, you know, four years of going through it. You know, we're talking about a short one just to help you. So we think about it. If it's something you're interested in, we'll try. But notice, first of all, then, to give an offense is you have to sanctify Christ as Lord in your life. Second of all, we're being ready to make a defense. We all should be doing it. We do it through studying the Word of God and giving our personal testimony. What does the Word of God say? That's the only thing in 2 Peter 1, for instance, 21. That's the only book that's ever been written that's written by the Holy Spirit moving men. Every other book is written by men. The third thing you notice he has back in the uh, First Peter chapter 3, and notice it says, keeping a good conscience. And then he also goes down later in 16, good behavior. Keeping a good conscience. How do you keep a good conscience in good behavior? We already saw it in Psalms 119. What's our standard? It's the Word of God. How many of us are living in, in a world today in which the standard is changing? We don't believe the Word of God is the standard we should have. And if we have it, people think you're old-fashioned and you ought to change. We have a standard that's just lived by the standard that we're given. What does the Word of God say? Whether you agree with it or not, it's irrelevant. The Word of God is still there. I think it's the uh, stumbling block is the second thing. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Bad company does what? Corrupts good morals. Proverbs 22, 24 and 25. If you're a round person given the anger, what's going to happen? You're going to be like You'll pick up the anger. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, and Paul's writing again to Timothy, he says, flee youthful lust, but then pursue things with those of like mind. So we're going to become like the people we're with. So when you think about the good behavior and so on, who do we spend our time with? Makes a big difference. How many of you have even noticed it in speech or anything else? I talked to my oldest sister on the phone. Well, she's been living in the Chicago area and then now in Wisconsin for the last 40-some years. Do you think she has a different accent than when I knew her growing up? Totally different accent. Now, why from Alabama? Especially when she goes back to Alabama. It's amazing, the accent. I mean, everybody, we have certain things we like to, words that we like to get her to repeat because when she says them differently, you, we become like the people that we're with. And I think it's important for us to recognize it. Turn over to Psalms 1, and we'll end here. In Psalms chapter 1. <clears throat> So keeping a good conscience, one is we have a standard, which is the Word of God. Two, remember, our stunning blocks, who we associate with. But I think it's interesting in, in Psalms chapter 1, he's going to tell us three different things in verse 1 down to verse 3. And it's interesting what he has when he says this. <clears throat> Notice he said, how blessed, which is plural in the text, meaning happy, is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Talking about walking means to go along with. The counsel means to guide in the purpose. So in other words, I'm not going along with or being guided or have their purpose of the unrighteous or the wicked. Do we have news media today and all of the different stuff that's going out that's trying to persuade us on different things? Everybody's trying to change. Notice the next thing. Nor stand... The word there for stand means to walk or it's your matter of life. Don't walk in the path or the journey of the sinner, the misguided, the criminal, talk about in the eyes of, of the world, uh, of Christ rather. And then notice the next part he has, nor sit. The sitting in a place, when you've got to go back to the early days when they were sitting in the gate and so on, means to associate and rest with, and you're spending your time with, and you're talking not that we don't talk to sinners, but we're not, and we, as we should, but we're not associating so far as getting our ideas from and everything else. There's a difference between talking to a sinner about Christ and spending your entire time and engaging and coming up with their philosophies and so on. 
Um, if you don't believe that, that, that part of it, just stop and think and look back at your pictures from yesteryear. How many of you would change some of the clothes you wear and some of the hairdos you had if you could go back and change those things? But you would swear that your people you were with had no influence on you. And you look back on it and you'd have to honestly say what? Yes, they did. And same thing can happen with music or anything else. I remember growing up, I'd say, oh, I don't listen to the words, I just like the music. It's amazing that song can come on 50 years later and I can quote the words of the song and I never intended to even learn the words of the song. They have a lot greater influence than what we realize. So think about it. So the thought is, over the past week, time-wise, did you spend more time listening and watching the news or reading the Word of God or listening to it or whatever? Because they're influencing us Music, everything else. Uh, who is your guide? We have a lot of guides. So if you already mentioned a lot of teachers that she has, and if you remember, and we're told in Luke six forty, a teacher, a pupil is not above his teacher, but when he's fully trained, he'll be as his teacher. We have a lot of teachers who are teaching us, and we'll be like. So let's think about it for applications today. Just kind of an introductory deal. But uh, anybody like to give their testimony? Then come up and sing. We'd love to hear it. Anybody not want to hear somebody's testimony? Hey, first time no hands went up. <laughs> We'd all love to hear people's testimony, and you learn more about them, and you understand them better. But the second thing, you know, I think about: it, Are you interested in taking the class? You know, we don't want to have a class that unless people are interested in. It, but at the same time, how we do it, where we do it, and so on. But to talk about the other one, you stop and think about it. In just uh, in keeping a clear conscience, just looking at our own life based on the Word of God, not what other people think, and how not compared to our somebody else. I'm better than so and so, but according to the Word of God and to Christ, is there something that I need to change and correct? And then you, when people will attack you, they will have to say good behavior, and they recognize that you're serving the Lord and so on. Uh, and you never know when that can take place and how you can do it. Uh, so just think about it this week. Be ready to give a defense. Don't make an excuse. Do it gently with reverence. And there'll be opportunities, I guarantee. There'll be opportunities, I guarantee. There'll be opportunities, I guarantee. There'll be opportunities.